welcome everyone here to Grace Point Church, and we honestly believe this. Your past does not have to define your future and hit because of his grace and mercy. And you also may be wondering what happened in the service here just a few minutes ago, is that you heard someone speak forth in a language you probably did not know, and then we waited a while and someone gave an interpretation of what that language was. And I want to assure you that's found in Scripture. In 1 first, in first Corinthians, the 12th chapter, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant. And verse 10, it says, To another working of miracles, another prophecy, to a, another the discerning of spirits, another of diverse kinds of tongues, and to another an interpretation of tongues. And what we experienced was the, the supernatural move of the Holy Spirit speaking to us and giving us a word of encouragement. And that word of encouragement was, we don't have to be fearful that God is with us and God is for us. And I'm so grateful for those gifts that are still in operation today. And they're, they're here to edify and build up the body of Jesus Christ. Glory to his name. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Also, I have a video I want you to watch here. Happy Thanksgiving. Amen. Enter his courts with praise and with thanksgiving. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, the message this morning is going to be called, The Antidote to Worry is a Good Dose of Thanksgiving. Amen. You know, we're talking about a lot of antidotes here lately, but you know what? We need a good antidote for worry. Philippians 4, starting in verse 4, says this, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And I like verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are, uh, are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which you have have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you and praise you for this opportunity to be back in your house and to be in your presence, Lord. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for the time we've had to worship you. We thank you, Lord God, that you, that you uh, uh, spoke to us through your spirit this morning, Lord God. But we also thank you, Lord God, for the time to look into your word. And Lord Jesus, I ask right now that you would give me a fresh anointing from on high, that your word would go forth to accomplish the purpose for which it was sent, because your word will not return void. And now, Lord God, we commit the rest of this service into your care. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people who agreed said... Amen. Praise the Lord God. Again, the title of the message is The Antidote for Worry is a Good Dose of Thanksgiving. 
And, you know, I asked the Lord what he'd have me uh, preach here this morning, and, and one of the things that just came to my mind very clearly, and I believe the Holy Spirit did that, is that right now we're in a living in a nation, especially in this time, where we're, people are so not only filled with fear, but they're also filled with worry. How many people worry a lot? You know, right now we got people worrying about COVID-19, we got people worrying about the presidential election and its final results, whichever way it may go. We got people worrying about health situations with the family. Uh, we got people worrying about if they're going to be able to keep their jobs, they're going to lose their jobs, they're going to be able to see their loved ones at Thanksgiving. And we have people worrying about, are we going to stay a nation that's founded upon the principles of our founding fathers, or is our nation going to take a turn and go towards a socialist type situation? And if we're not careful, we as God's people can allow the world's worry to begin to fill our own lives and our own souls. And I have some good news for you today, saints of God. God does not want his people walking around in worry. And I'm going to say this again. A good antidote for worry is a good dose of thanksgiving. Amen. And you say, well, you know what? You live in this world for a while. This world's going to give you something to worry about. And if we're not careful, yeah, that can be true. You know, I, I saw this study the other day that said everyone who was born in 1801 and breathed air died. <laughs> and so they assume then breathing air is dangerous to your life. You know, and that's the kind of nonsense that can go on in the world out there if we're not very, very careful as Christians. And the word worry means this, and the word worry is an Anglo-Saxon word. It means to strangle. And I got to ask in the Lord about this. Lord, why, what is worrying trying to strangle in our lives? And the first thing is simply was this. The wor worry wants to strangle the peace of God in your life. Worry wants to strangle the joy of the Lord in your life. As a matter of fact, that emotional pain that you're feeling while you're worrying is that you're being strangled spiritually. And I believe this is a trick of the enemy. God does not want his people being full of worry and being strangled by worry, but God wants his chosen people. Are you God's chosen people today? Give me a waiver. If I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, then you are God's chosen people today. Amen? And God wants you to walk in his peace. God wants you to walk in his strength. God wants you to walk with thanksgiving in your heart. As a matter of fact, saints of God, in the midst of trials... God wants you to be thankful. Amen. Amen. Say, but I'm going through a trial. Let me tell you something right now. Even in the trial, we're to offer up thanksgiving to our God because He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's our Lord and Savior. And saints of God, especially when you're going through hard, difficult times, it's where you need to be thankful for what God has already done for you and what God's going to do for you. Can you say amen to that with me? Praise God. You know, the United States government established the holiday, and, and I think it was a good idea to establish the holiday of Thanksgiving to give praise and thanks to God, but they didn't have it as an original idea. Thanksgiving is God's original idea. Amen. And so I want to look at some truths here, how we, give this, how we can give a good dose of Thanksgiving. And the first way is this, you're taking notes. Number one, what we have to know, why we can be thankful at all times, amen, is this, God will supply all our needs. Amen. Philippians 4 19 says this, my God shall supply all my needs. Now I'm going to stop there just for a moment. How many of your needs? All, all your needs. How many believe that to be true today? Amen. So my God shall supply all your, all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. And I love this word supply here. This word supply means this in, in the Greek. It means will fill up, will make full, supply fully and completely. And the idea here is simply as this, God knows how to supply every one of our needs, he knows how to meet every one of our needs, but not only does he want to do it, he has the resources to do it. Now I would like to help everyone in this church right now. I wish I had the resources to pay off every one of your homes. Anyone like that idea? But guess what? I don't have the resources. I want to do it, I would love to do it, but I don't have the resources. So I'm not much help to you, right? But let me tell you right now, my God wants to meet your needs, but not only does he want to meet your needs, he has the resources to meet those needs. And so, saints of God, I don't have to walk in despair and worry about my resources and my needs because I know beyond any shadow of a doubt that my God is able to supply every one of my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus my Lord. That's the reason to be thankful, amen? And the idea here, saints of God, is not only meeting the physical needs, but also the spiritual needs. My God is able to meet all my needs. He is awesome. 
The Bible talks about in the book of Psalms that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And that is simply meaning this, is that God has an abundant supply. I like to add to that. Not only does he own the cattle on a thousand hills, he, owns, he also owns all the taters under those hills too. And he provides them for God's people. Glory to his name. Amen. So here's what I believe that God is speaking to us right now as a church and as a nation. Stop worrying about what's going on around us. Take it seriously. Yes, it's a serious situation. Yes, the things are going on, it's real. But I don't have to be full of worry about what's going on because I know my God will take care of me. And I know your God will take care of you too because we serve the true and the living God. Amen. Hallelujah. So saints of God, stop the worrying as a matter of fact, saints of God, the more we see things going on, the more we need to be thankful to our God. Because the Bible tells us this and the signs of the last days, and whether you want to believe it or not, I believe we're living in the last of the last days. And one of the signs that we're living in the last days is there'll be a people that are unthankful. And I've never been around so many people in all my life, a generation that is so unthankful for all the blessings that God has given unto this nation. We are a blessed nation because we started this nation on the foundation that God's word was central and God was important to this land and God has blessed this land. So don't let anyone condemn you because of the blessings that we have, but we have to be very, very careful we don't turn those blessings into God. Instead, we need to make sure we need to give God thanks for the blessings he has provided for us. Our blessings can't save us but our God can. Amen? So thanksgiving is, is an attitude, saints of God, where we have to have towards God, not just because of material things, not because of uh, the, the spiritual things, but simply because He is our God, He is our Lord, and He is our Savior, and He will meet all our needs. And here's something very important about material things. If your, the material things aren't wrong by themselves, it's not wrong for God to bless you and provide material things for you. Material, material things become wrong when those material things get you instead of you having the material things. You see, when God gives us things, when he wants to bless his people, we become stewards of what God has given to us, and God wants us to be good stewards of those things. How many want to be a good steward of God's things? Because here's what I've noticed. When you're a good steward of God's things, he gives you more and more. But when you're not a good steward of what God gives you, would you give a kid of yours who wasted everything you gave him? Would you give him more? I don't think we would. But when we're good stewards, God blesses us even more and more and more. But here's something else, saints of God. When we walk in thanksgiving, it also changes the way we think and act. It changes our mind. Colossians 3 and 15 says this. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which also you are called into one body. And what's that last part? Be thankful. How many want to walk in peace? I like this word peace here. You know, let the peace of God rule in your mind. And that peace of God is the presence and the power of God, the, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. That peace of God rule in your hearts. And this word rule is a very interesting word here. It's not going to be on the screen. That word in the Greek means this. It means to umpire. What does an umpire do? He calls balls. He calls strikes, out of bounds, inbounds, fair, and all those kind of stuff. And we are, we're supposed to let the peace of God rule our hearts and rule our minds. And saints of God, here's something very important for us to understand. When we walk in thanksgiving continually before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we're continually thankful for what he's done for us. It will cause our mind to have this kind of peace. How many want this kind of peace? But that peace of God is supposed to rule our hearts and rule our minds. And if we start to get involved in something that causes that peace to be kind of like fading away, where we see that peace kind of gone and that confusion, it's not, that, that confusion is there instead of peace, let me tell you right now, God has not given us a spirit of confusion. And if our peace of God is being broken because of something that's going on around, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what is happening here. Why is my peace being broken? And you're, what you're going to find out is the Holy Spirit will reveal something to you that you need to get away from this, you need to run from this, you need not to be involved in this because the peace of God is umpiring and saying, that's out, that's not correct, leave it alone. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, I am so grateful, so grateful for God's 
presence, God's power, God's blessings, his word. Because, saints of God, we can have a breakthrough in our whole lives if we get on this concept. I'm thanking God continually. Thank God my name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. How many are glad you're saved today? Hallelujah. How many are glad that one day, very, very soon probably, that we may be raptured out of this place? <laughs> Glory to his name. Hallelujah. I know, and I'm so grateful to know that God gives only good and perfect gifts. I am so glad to know my God is for me. If my God be for me, who can possibly be against me? I am so grateful to know today, thank God that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Thank God I'm more than a conqueror through him who loves us. Thank God I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Saints of God, if we'll come to that place where we begin to thank him in all situations, Situations, not for all situations, but in all situations, God can change our mind and we can be free of worry and we can walk in God's peace. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. The next claim here, the next good dose of thanksgiving is this. Number two, if you're taking notes, claim and anticipate the promises of God. Claim and anticipate the promises of God. Again, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. And the idea here is simply as this, saints of God, I am still silly enough to believe this is God's word. I am still, I'm still silly enough to believe that it's inspired, it's perfect, infallible. I'm still silly enough to believe that God sent this book to be our guide that we walk, live by, that we walk by. And I'm still silly enough to believe it applies to us today. How many people are silly with me today? Amen. It is still God's infallible, perfect word. And he gave this book to us to learn, to learn how to walk with him, how to live in victory, how to walk in peace, how to walk in thanksgiving. And when God gives a promise, saints of God, you and I need to stand up and say, Lord, I claim that promise for my situation. I claim that promise for my life. And then you come before God and you say, I have a need, God. But Lord, you have promised me that you will meet all my needs. I am not going to be worried about it, but I'm going to give you thanksgiving in advance. Lord, you will meet my needs. And how do I know that's going to happen? Because his word says it will. But I also have this personal experience, which doesn't supersede the word, by the way. I got his word, but then I got personal experience how God has met my needs over and over and over again. How many can say today, you can look over your life and say, I can tell you one, two, or three, or four times where God has met my needs. Amen. I, I, I've shared this story probably, I don't know, a long time ago. But when I was a Bible college student, how many of you know that when you're a student in Bible college, you're rich? No, it wasn't the case. And I remember a situation happening when I was in Bible college. And I had to mail a letter. And I can't remember, this postage was either 23 cents or 24 cents. I don't remember for sure what it was, but that'll tell you how long ago it was, Okay. I went through my car seats. Everyone ever done it? Try to find loose change. And, and, and my ashtray. She said, we don't smoke, so we always threw change in the ashtray. Nothing. I went everywhere looking. I needed to buy a postage stamp. I needed a quarter. And you know how much money I had? Nothing. You know how much money I found? Nothing. And so I said, God, this is really silly, God, but you said you'll supply my needs. And God, I need a postage stamp. And I started praying for a 25-cent postage stamp. Some of you are looking at me like, man, that guy's lost it. He's nuts. Amen? But the Holy Spirit spoke to my spirit. And this was on a Saturday, and the, 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 the college uh, post office was closed. So I don't know how I was going to work through that. But anyway, yeah, I did. There was a machine down there. You remember those machines? You stuck your quarter in, and you pushed the thing down, and it slid out the thing to you. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, go down to the stamp machine and look on top. So I got out of my dorm room, went down to the post office there, and, and looked on top of that, 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 the, the stamp machine, and guess what I found? A one cent stamp. 25 to one, okay. I said, okay, God. So all of a sudden, I went back to the dorm room, and said, God, you're gonna meet my need. Went back to the dorm room, he says, Go back to the stamp machine. So I go back down to the chat machine, and this time I look on top, and guess what? There are two one-cent stamps. I said, okay, God, now that's, that's, you know, I've got three cents now, God, you know, three stamps. I need, I, need, I need 22 more, God, or whatever it was, 24, 23, whatever it was, then I need more. And the Holy Spirit said, go back down now. This went on and on and on until guess what? 
I got enough one cent stamps to mail that envelope. <laughs> that whole envelope was covered with one cent stamps. <laughs> so why am I saying that? Let me tell you, saints of God, if God can take care of that silly little need, there is nothing in your life that is too big that he cannot take care of also. Because it's one thing I realize about God. <laughs> There's nothing big to him. It's all things that he can take care of and all things that he can deal with. And saints of God, I believe it's time for we as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to begin to rise up and say, God, your word says this. I believe your word. I will accept your word. And I'm going to trust you to meet the needs. I don't have to worry any longer, but I can thank him in advance. He will supply all my needs. I just got to claim the promise and believe in him to do it. Amen. God's good, isn't he? You see, Psalms, uh, Proverbs 23 and 7 says this, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And here's what happens when worry begins to strangle you. You begin to think on the negative. You begin to look at the negative. And the more you think on the negative, the more you look on the negative, the more you magnify the negative, the bigger that negative gets in your life. God doesn't want us to magnify the negative. But I claim the promises and begin to magnify the promises of God in my life. And the more I magnify the promises of God in my life, the more faith will well up in my soul. The more worry will be driven out. And the more I begin to thank Him and praise Him, and the more peace I have in my life. Saints of God, even when things don't work out the way I think they should work out, I still can trust God my God, and be thankful. Say amen. amen. Praise God. It leads me to point number three this morning is this, the next truth about a good dose of thanksgiving. Ready for this one? Rejoice in the fruit of trials. Oh, glory to God. How many like that one? You know, that's one of those scriptures you want to say, God, I don't like that. How many are like me? When you're going through a trial, the last thing on your mind is to rejoice. Anyone understand what I'm talking about? That is not natural to rejoice in the middle of a trial. What's natural in the middle of a trial? Gloom, despair, and agony on me, deep down depression, extensive misery. You know, that's what's normal. But saints of God, I want you to understand something today. We do not serve a normal God. We serve a supernatural God who's greater than our normal thoughts and our normal feelings. Glory to His name. Hallelujah. And, and so here, saints of God, we have to learn something, that when God takes us through something, there's going to be some positive fruit on the other end. And I know I'm going to be drowned out by all the amens on that one because we don't want to go through the things. Jesus told us, you ready for this? In this world you shall have tribulation glory to God are you alive today is there blood flowing through your veins well guess what you're gonna have trials and tribulations until Jesus comes and gets us the question is how do we respond to those trials and tribulations do we allow them to tear us down? Do we allow them to destroy us? Or do we make a conscious decision, Lord, I am going to rejoice in you in all situations. A matter of fact, is rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Why did Paul have to say rejoice twice? I'll tell you why. Because we're knuckleheads. Because sometimes we don't get it the first time. How many of you ever had kids like that? They had selective hearing is what I like to call it when my kids had it. So when you say something twice, I got news for you. When God says something twice in the, in the Bible, it means pay attention because what I am telling you is very, very, very important. You want to have victory over worry? Learn to rejoice in all situations, okay? Saints of God, the word rejoice here simply means to be glad. It means to be filled with joy. It means to take pleasure in our God. He is our God. He is our Lord, and He is our Savior. We are to rejoice in Him in all situations because our God is still bigger than the trials that we are facing today. Hallelujah. Our God is still bigger than COVID-19. Our God is still bigger than the presidential election, however it goes. Our God is still bigger than all the plans that the enemy has against us. Our God is bigger. And because He's bigger, I can rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, 
James 1 and 2. You ready for this? My brethren, who is he talking to? Us. He says, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptation. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Can I tell you, that's not a natural response, but it can be a supernatural response. When we learn the secret of giving thanks to God in all situations. Now, hear me. He didn't say all situations were good. COVID-19 is not good. Not good. He didn't say all situations were good. He never said rejoice for the situations. He said rejoice in the situations. There was a big difference. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm facing, and I'm sure each one of us in this room could testify about some terrible situation we've gone through or currently going through, in that situation, it may not be good, but in that situation, I can still rejoice in the Lord. I can still give Him thanksgiving because He is still my Lord, my Savior, my Master, my Healer, my Deliverer, my all in all. And if I begin to rejoice and give Him thanksgiving, I will respond correctly to the trial. But here's what's so awesome, saints of God, when we get through the trial, Hear me, you will get through the trial. You know why? James 1 and 3 says this, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Say patience. Verse 4, But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire and wanting nothing. There's something I have learned. When God deals with you, you better learn the lesson the first time. Because if not, you're going to repeat it. (laughs) And it's not always fun repeating those lessons. But here's what I do know. When I get through the trial with the right attitude, rejoicing in my Lord, thanksgiving for my salvation, I will have fruit from that trial that I went through. And hear me, going through that trial will make you stronger personally and cause your relationship with Jesus to grow deeper and deeper because now you see him not only as your savior you see him as your provider you see him as the one who's able to take you through the flood through the waters and come on the other side with victory we will be victorious in every situation can you say amen to that hallelujah so the reason I rejoice is not for the situations I rejoice in the situations And the power of God flows, and we will be victorious. The next truth about a good dose of thanksgiving is this. We are more than conquerors. Now, how many like that? How many believe in miracles? How many believe God gives miracles? How many want to see miracles? Be careful what for you just asked. Why do you need a miracle? Because you're going through a difficult, hard situation. You need a miracle. Why are you more than a conqueror? Because there's things you have to conquer. God says you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. Hear me. Very, 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 very important here, saints of God. We as God's people can depend upon God's power, His strength, His anointing, His leading to take us through every situation we are facing. But here's what happens many, many times. We like it when God instantly removes the obstacle. How many know that God can do that? I prefer that. Anyone else prefer that? I prefer God to remove the obstacle and I'm free. But here's what I've learned over my life so far is this. Sometimes He doesn't remove the obstacles. He takes us through the obstacles. A good example of that is that the children of Israel, they're they're leaving Egypt, and and they're heading for freedom. Hallelujah, God's done a miracle. He's taken them out. And what do they run into? The Red Sea. And then, okay, we'll take a break here. We'll just rest at the Red Sea for a moment. But all of a sudden, what comes behind? The enemy comes behind. And hear me, saints of God, when you're walking in God's will, you're doing what God's called you to do, and it feels like everything's going right, and that obstacle comes in, you know what's going to happen? The enemy is going to come back behind you and try to take you back to slavery. Amen? And so I want to tell you right now, in the natural, it does not look good. 
In the natural, it looks like a terrible situation. You know, here's God's people, the Red Sea, and Pharaoh and his army coming in after him. And it looks like God's people are going to be destroyed and taken back to, to, to captivity. <laughs> well, I have good news for you today, saints of God. My God is still able to open the Red Seas in your situation. No matter what it looks like in the natural, he didn't remove the Red Sea. He took him through the Red Sea. God will take us through the difficult times. And when we're, it's all said and done, saints of God, we will be victorious. Our faith will increase. Our trust in him will increase. But here's a special part of the fruit is this. I now have compassion for others who are going through what I've gone through. And I'm able then to help them. Now, myself personally, I have never experienced a broken bone. Praise God from whom all blessings fell. But I have to assume that it's painful. And because I've never experienced it, I really don't understand. But how many have ever had a broken bone? You understand because you've experienced, you've gone through it. So now if I were, God forbid not speaking this into existence, if I were to break a bone, you could come to me and say, you know what, it hurts for a while, but guess what? It will heal up, you will be stronger when it's all said and done, and you are going to get through this victoriously because you yourself have gone through it. And I believe that's a lot of the reasons why God allows us to go through situations, to increase our faith, to build us up, to make us stronger so we can be a blessing to other people also. We are more than conquerors to him who loved us. And here's an important fact I want to bring out here. When we're going through these things where we need to be those conquerors, we need to keep our focus on Jesus during this time. And I'm going to uh, recall the story of Peter. How many remember the story of Peter walking on the water? Peter was in the midst of the storm. The ship looked like it was going down. People were fearful. People were worrying. They were going to lose everything. They are going to lose their lives. I mean, it was a terrible thing to go through. I wouldn't want to be on that, okay? And all of a sudden, they see Jesus coming and walking on the water, but they didn't recognize Jesus as it was coming on the water. They thought he was a ghost. And that filled him with even more fear and more worry. Your ghost is coming after us. But thank God how Jesus spoke to him and then said, you know, and Peter said, Lord, if it be you, bid me to come out of the boat and come to you. And Jesus said to him, you know what, Peter? I'm paraphrasing here. It's me, Peter. Come out of the boat. I want to ask you a question. How many of you would have got out of the boat? I hear people all the time criticize Peter. Peter, why? That's terrible. You're a terrible person. You sunk. You war was your faith. Why didn't you trust? And I say, be still. He got out of the boat. Most of us wouldn't have got out of the boat. <laughs> be honest. I probably wouldn't have got out of the boat. He got out of the boat. But here's what we can learn from that story. As long as he focused on Jesus, what did he do? He walked on the water. But when he started focusing on the wind and the waves, what happened? He got his fo focus off of Jesus, onto the storm, and he began to sink. But I like the rest of the story. He cries out, Lord, help me. And what does Jesus do? You no good, rotten person. You have a, where's your faith? I, I'm just so mad at you. Is that what he did? Absolutely not. He reached down his hand grabbed Peter's hand, lifted him back up. He just said, oh, Peter, why didn't you just believe? And I like the rest of it. And they walked together back to the boat. <laughs> you know what that says to me, saints of God? I'm a more than a conqueror because my Lord and Savior will reach out and grab my hand and help me get back to the boat. But i got to keep my focus in on him. Glory to his name. Amen. The next truth I want to look at here is this. The next truth about a good dose of thanksgiving is always, not just once in a while, rejoice. You don't rejoice just when you feel like it. How many are like me on that? How many, before you got to church, had a big fight with your spouse? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> 
you come in the house of God, you're No one resembles that in this place, right? <laughs> you know what you should do when you've had that big fight with your spouse? Start rejoicing in the Lord. <laughs> Lord, you're so good, you're so awesome, and I know I'm right. No, never mind. <laughs> But when you come into the house of God, you need to come in with a spirit of anticipation of God's presence, His anointing. You need to come in in this place rejoicing. I'm going to enter the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the fairest of 10,000 to the soul, my lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, my healer, my deliverer, my counselor, my savior, my soon coming king. When we come into the house of God, we ought to be rejoicing because we're going to be in His manifest presence because the scripture said where two or three are gathered in my name that He is in our midst. Saints of God, God is in the house when we come to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So I want to encourage you, leave all that trash outside the door and come in rejoicing because your God is going to be in the house today. Hallelujah. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Not just when I feel like it. Amen. Now, Philippians verses 5, 6, and 7. Those are great verses. And if you want to live in those verses, we've got to learn to rejoice and be thankful in all situations. Philippians 4 and 5 says, Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And this word moderation, I love it, because you know what it means? Gentleness and sweet reasonableness. Uh-oh. <laughs> Let your gentleness and sweet reasonableness be known unto all men. How many passive-aggressive people do I have here? (laughs) Our gentleness and sweet reasonableness should be visible to all. All men will know that you're my disciples because you have love for one another. The whole world should see Jesus in our lives. As a matter of fact, Paul says we are epistles written for all men to read. We should have that moderation in our life, that sweet gentleness, that sweet kindness. And the only way you're going to get that, saints of God, is learn to rejoice and give thanksgiving in God in all situations. Amen. Philippians 4 and 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. God. I like that part here, saints of God. Be careful for nothing means don't worry. Don't worry about the things. Don't worry about this. Don't be anxious about this. But with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And let me say something here about our request. When we pray to God, we need to pray not only, you know, God, this is what I like to see happen, but God, we want your will to be done. Because something I have learned, I can be selfish in my prayers. Anyone else selfish in your prayers? I want, I want, I want, my, my way, my way, my way. But one of the things you'll learn very, very quickly as you begin to pray, give thanks, and rejoice in the Lord, He has a way of redefining our prayers. So our prayers line up with his perfect will. And when our prayers line up with his perfect will, we can ask what we want, and we will have because we, our prayers line up with his will, and his will be done. Amen? Philippians 4 and 7 says this, And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. I tell you right now, saints of God, the time we're living in, that's a scripture that we all need to be living in, that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. As a matter of fact, the Lord spoke to us through the gifts in that portion of Scripture. I thought that was cool, God. Saints of God, here's something about peace I want you to understand. Peace of God is not the same definition as peace in the world. The peace of God is something that comes from our relationship with Jesus Christ that's not dependent on external circumstances. It's dependent upon our relationship with Him. 
when we are with him where we need to be, he blesses us with perfect peace in the midst of everything that's going on. Peace in the world is dependent on absence of conflict. Peace in the world is dependent upon the good circumstances happening around you. And I can tell you, as long as we're in this world, there's not always going to be good circumstances around us. And if our peace is dependent upon the circumstances around us, we'll never have peace. But when my peace is based on my relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, when I'm rejoicing in His presence, when I'm thankful for all that He's done, His perfect peace will keep us in all situations. You say amen? amen? Praise God. Leads me to the next one. I'll hit these fast here. The next truth about a good dose of thanksgiving is this. Stop being concerned about what other people think, especially unbelievers. Yeah. Now, hear me here. Hear me, hear me, hear me here. We, as God's people, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, cannot allow our culture to determine what is truth for our church and for our lives. We cannot allow the unbelievers to tell us what we can teach, what we can preach, and what we cannot and cannot do. What is happening in so many places is, is the world has become a light to the church, and the church is becoming more like the world and that is not God's plan and not God's way. God's way was this. We are to be his hands and feet. We are to be the light to the world. We are the one who's to take the gospel message. We are the one to teach the truth. And here's what I want us to understand. God's truth does not change, even if the majority in the nation says it's wrong. God's word is established forever and ever in the heavens. It said every jot and every tittle will come to pass. God's word is the final authority for a Christian's life. Now what happens if you don't agree with God's word? You need to get right with God. I'll be honest, there are some scriptures that I read when I first saved, and I ran across those scriptures, you know, I look at my Bible, and, and, you know, and, and I run across this portion of scripture, and I say, oh, I don't like that portion of scripture. You know why I didn't like that portion of scripture? Because it was convicting me. And here's what I see people do when it comes to the Word of God. I don't like that portion of scripture, so let's rip it out. Fortunately, it wasn't my Bible. <laughs> but that's what we can do if we're not careful. If we're not careful. We begin to choose and pick because society says we shouldn't agree with this. Society says we shouldn't do this. Society should we be this way. We should be that way. Let me tell you something, saints of God. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ cannot allow the world to determine what we believe and what we practice. Now, with that said, we should show love to everyone. Everyone. Everyone should be welcome in the house of God. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ should not be a memorial to dead saints. It should be a hospital for sick people spiritually. When someone comes in the house of God, I don't care what their background is. I don't care what they may be going through. I don't care what they may be in right in the middle right now. They need a God who loves them, a God who will deliver them, and a God who will set them free. And that will never happen if we compromise our beliefs and make them comfortable in their sin. Good preaching, Pastor. God is good. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God is so good. The next truth I want to look at, a good dose of thanksgiving, is this. Don't take your eyes off of heaven. Amen. Amen. Significant. Thank God for your salvation. I know you've heard me say this many, many, many times, saints. We're just pilgrims, strangers, and aliens going through this life. Amen? Amen. But here's what I do know. I'm a homeowner in heaven. Amen? I'm a home, homeowner in heaven. And my goal and your goal is simply as this, to hear, well done, 
my good and faithful servant. Amen. Amen. Luke 12, 4 through 5 says this, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. Don't be fearful of the world around us. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which, is ab- fear him which after he killeth has a power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And that word fear there is a respect. We need to respect our God. Amen. If man takes our life, all they can do is take our earthly life. If the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But he can't take my eternal life. But the one I need to respect and reverence and fear is the one who not only can take my life, but also then cast my soul into hell. And I know people don't want to hear about hell anymore in the church. And I believe this to be true. If there's more hell in the pulpit, there'd be less hell in the pews. But I need to reverence the one who can say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. I need to fear the one who who, who can say, sorry, you rejected me, you never received me, you never asked me into your heart and life, you turned away, you walked away. I need to reverence and fear that one who can affect my eternal destination. But when I reverence him, I love him, and I serve him. I'm not saying being perfect, because the only perfect person who ever walked on the face of the earth with Jesus, and they crucified him. But when I reverence and fear him, respect him, I guarantee you this, he'll help us cross the finish line. And we will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. God's good, isn't he? Not only is God good, saints of God, when we're with Him, we're right with Him, He calls us friends. I'm a friend of God. Wow. How many of us said, man, I don't have any friends? Get to know Jesus, and you've got the best friend in the world. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Saints of God, we need not be fearful of what this world will say, what this world will do. And even if we're taken into a court situation, the Bible talks about, at that moment in time, I will give you the words that you need to say. That's the power of the Holy Spirit moving in our lives. Saints of God, we can't be struck by fear and worry of the world because our faith, our hope, and our trust is in Jesus Christ. I'm going to close with this illustration. One of our pastors in Peru Uh, was given a message from a radical communist organization that operated a terrorist-style war there. And it was one of our churches, and the message was this. You have 48 hours to leave the city with your family, or we will begin to hang your children one by one. That's kind of of an eye-opener, isn't it? And the pastor knew this was his final warning, and he met with his deacon board and decided how to respond. And many of the churches in that region, and we, at that point in time, we had over 100 churches in that area, on, and those churches, family members were, sl- were slowly disappearing one by one, and many of them were killed. And some of the pastors had been killed. And so the board decided that they needed to do something because the, the, this army was even coming into the churches while they were holding service and taking machine guns and shooting down people. It's a terrible, terrible situation. And that's one of the things that's so frightening when I see people who think socialism and communism is okay because they don't understand what the real basis of that is. It's a terrible situation. But for whatever reason, the church board felt that the pastor just simply needed to, to go to Lima for a while and just stay away for just a little bit to let things cool down. Well, the next Sunday, there was no church, and the radicals left, and, they, and the radicals thought they had won. But the next week... That one of the deacons called, the, uh, called a meeting and decided that they were going to have church that next Sunday without the pastor there. And after they prayed, they agreed that they would have the service. They decided how they're going to divide up things. And the word spread around the area and that there was going to be a church service was going to be there. And to their surprise, nearly 500 people stood up, stood, came to that service, and there was only standing room only in the church and outside the doors. So that's how many people showed up, wanted to come to church. I say, like, glory to God to that. Well, members of the terrorist group found out what was going to happen, and they marched into the, the service, 
And while they were singing, they grabbed that deacon, they dragged him out, they strung a rope over the tree limb, and they hanged him right there on the spot. By this time, the crowd had grown, they say, oh, probably over 3,000 people to watch what was going on. And when the terrorists thought this, this deacon was gone, they thought he was dead, they lowered his body to the ground. And just as his body hit the ground, the deacon rose up. What a God we serve. That made the terrorists even more angry. And so you know what they did? They grabbed the same deacon again, put the rope around his neck even tighter than it was before, and they hung him again. And after they were convinced he was dead, they lowered him back to the ground. And then a group of the people there began to intercede, began to pray, and believe God to raise up that deacon. And guess what happened? The deacon started smiling, and he started laughing, and he was raised right back up just like that. And guess what the terrorists did? They ran in fear <laughs> because of how mighty our God is. Now, I like to tell you that happens every single time. I like to tell you it happens every single time, but I do know this. God is able to do those kind of things today when it is necessary. He's still able. My God is still able. So, saints of God, as I close this message this morning, I want all of us, all of us, just to remember how important it is to rejoice in the Lord. Give Him thanks in every situation. Not for the situations, but in every situation. And the peace of God will keep our minds and our hearts with whatever we're going through. And we will be victorious. Amen? I'd like every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment, if you would. One of the greatest decisions we'll ever have to make is this. What will I do with Jesus? Will I receive him as my Lord and Savior? Or will I reject him? And that's a choice each of us has to make as an individual. Because no one else can make that choice for you. And the Bible tells us clearly that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us, as pastor included, needed a Savior. And you may be thinking right now in your life, I have done so many terrible things. I've done so many wrong things. There is no way that God can forgive me. I need to tell you this truth. That is a lie from the pits of hell. There is nothing you have done in your life that is so terrible that God will not forgive if you simply ask him to do it. Because he's a God of great grace and mercy. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but, the, but through him the world might have life. See, we have to understand this, church, this truth. Jesus already paid the debt for our sins. He paid it in full on the cross when he said, it is finished, which means paid in full. The penalty for my sins has been paid in full on the day Jesus died on that cross. And now he says this, I have this great gift for you, gift of salvation. And like any gift, you have to receive it. If you're here today or watching online, and you have never come to that point in your life where you say, Jesus, I need you. Please forgive me of my sins. Come to my heart and life and be my Lord and Savior. I want to give you that opportunity today. With every head bowed, every eye closed, and no one looking around. If you need Jesus today, I just want you to lift your head up just for a moment and look at me. I need Jesus today. I need to have my sins forgiven. Maybe you say, I need to make a rededication of my life today. I know the truth. I, I know all this, but I really haven't been living that way. If that's you, just raise your head and look at me just for a second. Yes, there's one there. Someone else. 
ask everyone to pray this prayer with me right now, if you would. Repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you now to come to my heart and my life and be my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer and for giving me of my sins. And from this moment on, Lord, I pledge to live for you, to serve you the rest of my days. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer.